There is a story, an apocryphal one, um, in my profession, I'm a barrister, so I spend time speaking to judges, um, about a great advocate, a great barrister, who once went to a courtroom and said to the assembled judges, he said this, he said, my lords, because that's what you call a judge, he said, my lords, I'm going to make three arguments today. One is nonsense, one is just barely arguable, and one is unanswerable. But I'm not going to tell you which is which. Now, those of you who uh, see the humor in that can see that that's quite cheeky. That's a joke. It's silly. It's frustrating. It's, it's cheeky. And the reason it's cheeky is because when you listen to something, when you hear something, you need to know what it is and what the speaker actually intends by it. It's important to know what you're listening to and what the speaker intends by it. Because if you don't know, you can easily lose the significance. And that is the first thing I want us to see about Psalm 149. Okay? It is not primarily a written document that is confined to a book. What is it? Well, it's a song. It's a song. And there it is in verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song. And you would expect it to be set to music. Okay? We have dancing and the tambourine and the harp. I, I, I had a gag this morning about, um, about uh, Dancing Queen, but I can't do it here because we've already got tambourine in the text. Um, and I was looking online where, where it told me that tambourine, the word for tambourine was timbrel. Um, but it just goes to show that you should really check the sources that uh, the congregation are going to be looking at before you prepare your sermon. So, this is a piece of music, right? It's a piece of performance art. And not only is it a piece of performance art, it is a piece of community art in the sense that it is participatory, right? It invites people in. So, just music by itself, you might be thinking of a piano recital, or somewhere where you go just to, just to listen. But this isn't music like that. It has a sense of togetherness, inclusivity. You see in verses 1 and 5 and 9, do you see the phrase there, his faithful people? It's three times that phrase comes up in a very short psalm. So there's an emphasis on the community of the faithful people coming together. All right? And that is our theme for today's sermon. The title of it is Corporate Praise. And this isn't something that uh, you know, we, as Inspire St. James, have come up with out of nowhere. Um, this psalm is also one of the Church of England's readings for All Saints Day, because, I'm guessing here, but it seems right, that it is about all the saints, all the faithful people coming together in corporate praise. So this is a song, it's a piece of music, it's a piece of performance art, it's a piece of community art. Uh, and why is this significant? Well, because it's telling us something about the way that praise can be done. And there is something special and particular and peculiar about the way that praise happens when we do it together, corporately, as a people. So let us look at how that works in practice. And that is really the subject, I think, of the first half of the psalm. After the introductory verse 1, uh, we have verses 2 to 5. And I'll just read those again. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with tambourine and harp, for the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Let his faithful people rejoice in this honor and sing for joy on their beds. In case anybody's worried, beds are not for sleeping, they're actually for feasting. So this is a piece of furniture that you would use at a banquet. You would lie down and uh, reach out with one of your hands to take your um, grapes and your wine and what have you. So this is not a duvet day, this is an image of a feast, another act of togetherness and community. So anyway, it's important, I think, to read through that first half and to take it as a unit because there is a structure here, right? It goes like this. Verse 2, God is the maker and he is the king. Verse 3, the people dance and they make music. 
Verse 4, the Lord delights in his people and he crowns the humble. And verse 5, the people rejoice and sing. So what is the pattern? Well, it goes, God people, God people. And I want us to see three things as a result of that um, structural pattern. Okay, the first is that praise is a response. So it's something that flows from or ought to be caused by some attribute of, of God. So we find out that God is the maker and the king, and then there is dancing and music and so forth. Now, in one sense, that's quite natural. So if there, if there is a God, and if he made the universe, and if you can know him, is that not astonishing? Is that not extraordinary? And is it not amazing to see what he has created, whether it's the great expanse of the universe or the tiniest detail of how you are uniquely made. My wife is very keen on a television program called, um, called Fake or Fortune. Do you know that one? It's about, um, it's about pieces of art that are found across the country, and the question is whether or not the, the, art, the piece of art is by some uh, master artist, or it's just a, a, a fake made by often a criminal trying to make some money. And I think it's a very interesting question why it makes such a difference, whether this picture, which is you know, a very nice picture, um, is, has been painted by uh, a, real, a real artist or merely a... Why does that make a difference? But it does. It does. It's highly significant to people. And is it not highly significant that the person that you're sitting next to, the person that you see when you walk out into the street, is somebody who is made by God? He's the maker. And he is the king. So again, if this God is the king, if he is good and loving and pure and is in charge, is that not a great reassurance? Does that not mean that your life is not futile? And does it not mean that the things that Pete and Amy prayed for just a few moments ago are not things that will make us despair that the world is spinning out of control? I'm halfway through watching a film at the moment called Argo, which is a really interesting, based on a really interesting historical event in 1980 when um, some people were taken hostage in uh, Iran, and the Canadian government and the American Central Intelligence Agency got them out by setting up a fake film production company and pretending that they were all members of a film crew in Iran and getting them out on an aeroplane as if they had just been on a, uh, uh, a scout for locations. It's an amazing story. In one of the scenes, uh, the characters make the point that in order to make this plan work, we need a proper filmmaker to be in charge. We need, we need a big name to be running the project. And it gives the whole escapade a kind of credibility because they get a real um, Hollywood boss to run the whole sham. So again, that just made the point to me that we think it's very important, don't we, who is running something, who is behind something. And if God is the king, isn't that good news? So, of course, these people dance in response. How could they respond any other way? There is also a sense, though, and I'd like us just to explore this briefly, in which the response of praise is a little bit unusual and not quite consistent with what we normally think of as a response. Because it's not like there's cause and effect here in a classic sense, right? Because God hasn't just become the maker and the king. So it's not, this isn't a celebration like a coronation or a wedding, like you're celebrating some event that's just happened. Great. No, that's not what this is. And it's not new news either. So it's not that God has only just now let people know, oh, by the way, guys, I'm actually the maker and the king. Did you know that? This is very interesting. Like you've just got some good test result. Oh, great, I'm, I passed. 
No, not that either. This has been true all the time, and the people that the psalmist is addressing are the people of Israel would have been told this over and over again for many centuries. So what is the meaning of, what, what, what's the meaning of the word response when I'm saying that praise is a response? Well, I think the psalm is following the pattern of human thinking. So we don't have all true things in front of our mind at all times. There are moments when we have to call true things to the front of mind and then respond to them. And I think that's what Fee asked us to do at the beginning of this service when she said, you may not be in the mood for praise right now, but we can choose to call things to mind that will prompt us to respond in praise. And it seems to me from the psalm that the corporate and community aspect of that is really important and really helpful because the music and the dancing are collaborative and cooperative and engage people in a kind of network or web of activity. Uh, calling to mind the nature of God and then responding to it is best done corporately, and that's what we try to act out at church. We gather, to, we gather together to call to mind uh, what God is, and we do this, we, we do this now in the, in the sermon. We do it in the lyrics of the songs we sing. Uh, we do that through the art that we have on the windows that calls to mind images of what God is like. We do that by speaking to each other and reminding each other of theological truths, perhaps, or just small things that have happened in our weeks. And I think that doing that corporately really helps because we spur one another on and we engage in this kind of elaboration, this telling out, this singing out in a long line of call and response of the nature of God and our response to him. So that's the first thing. Praise is a response. The second thing from this part of the, of the psalm is that praise is not really framed as a command. The psalmist encourages us, wants us to, to, to praise the Lord, really passionately calls upon us to do that and calls upon the people in the psalm to do that. But it's not as though praise is framed as a requirement or that there's some kind of special payoff associated with praising the Lord. It seems to be that the psalmist na- views it as a natural response to the way that the Lord is. So the Lord is this way, and then, so let, let us praise. The Lord has done these things, so let us praise. And so it, it doesn't fall into the trap of just saying, be happy about something. Not an instruction or a command, which is very ineffective and reminds me of... Um, Captain Bly's instruction to the crew of the stricken HMS Bounty, the beatings will continue until morale improves. It just doesn't work. It's silly. Uh, no, instead, instead, the psalmist imagines and exhorts us to a community where we spur one another on to praise because we are engaged in this communal activity of reminding each other of the greatness of God and how we should respond. The third thing to see, and I've already really said this a couple of times, but I want to say it specifically now, is that there are two different things in here that the people respond to in praise. The first is what God is, so we've talked about maker and king. The the second is what God does, Right? So he, he delights in his people, and he crowns the humble. He lifts them up. He delights in his people. And these are, um, you, can, you could argue that they are attributes of God or what he is, but the emphasis is on what he is doing. Is he, is he blessing people? Has he blessed your life? What has he done for you? What are you aware of in your life that you see as God intervening, granting you good gifts? The psalmist wants to respond to those actions of God, what God does, as well as what God is. And this can be something all the way up from something very small. Lucky break that you got this week. Does that feel like God intervening in your life in a providential way? To something very big. Are you a Christian? Do you believe that God has intervened in your life by sending Jesus to die on the cross 
and then convicting you by the Holy Spirit of your sin and asking uh, and, and calling you to turn to him, changing the course of your life. So let's pause here and reflect on, on what all of this means, because I think this all informs our time together and what we're actually doing here in church when we come together on Sundays, but also what we're doing in church when we have small groups or when we just meet each other by, by, by chance in the street. I think this affects the way that we do community. Again, I'll just, uh, just taking the three things in turn, should we not be reminding each other of who God is? Have you had a reflection this week about who God is? What does it mean to you that he is the maker What has he made that amazes you? What does it mean to you that he is the king? What fear have you in your heart that might be addressed by talking about how he's in control? Maybe share that with somebody else because it may help you to share it and it may be that the other person really needs to hear what you have to say as well. Should we not be sharing encouragements with one another Let's find ways to spur each other on, to build each other up, and engage in this, what I've called this network, this dance of song, this song of praise. Maybe not literally, but can we do that in substance by asking each other, what is there to be glad about? What should I be glad about in your life? Tell me. Tell me. And finally, should we not be thinking not, of, not just of what God is, but what God has done? After the service this morning, I went outside. I preached the same sermon this morning. It, it, it was slightly different. But I went outside this morning, and someone came up to me and shared she, very quickly, uh, in not in much detail, but very frankly and disarmingly, um, that this person had been worried about a very difficult relationship with somebody else uh, in church, but then had, had suddenly found that they had uh, something amazing in common, and they had just almost spontaneously got over this difficulty and started sharing things with each other, sharing difficulties in their lives with each other in a really meaningful way, as if they were very close friends. And I just thought, that's amazing. It's an amazing work of the Holy Spirit in this community, in this church. I would not have known about that. I would not have been able to respond to it in praise unless that person had felt able to share with me. So can I ask you, is there something that you'd like to share with somebody else after the, after the service or at any other time? Um, to prompt that kind of praise in that way. Now that's the first half of the psalm, and you might feel that that's quite enough already, thank you very much, Um, because we've done some careful reading of the text, and I've asked you to think about some things which might be not particularly easy to do, being quite frank and open with with each other. But I think we also do need to spend a little bit of time dealing with the second half of the psalm, because there's a bit bit of a tone shift there. Um, You'll see that in the first half we've got a lot of uh, feasting and joy. Remember the beds that are feast, togetherness. It's very convivial. Second half of the psalm, we have people appear to be bearing arms um, and they seem to be going off to perform what looks like some kind of a rest. So, I mean, let's look at, let's look at it precisely. We can take it quite quickly, um, because I think that the the bare facts of what's going on are relatively easy to understand, and then let's try to unpack it. So the bare facts of what's going on, verse 6, these people are engaged in praise, the praise is in their mouth. But verse 6, as I say, they are armed with this double-edged sword. Quite an important image, that one, so put a pin in that, we might come back to it. Um, Verses 7 and 9, there's some kind of vengeance or punishment or sentence, which is like, um, like... is passed by a criminal court against some people. Verse 8, that punishment is fetters, shackles, imprisonment. People people seem to be taken captive. And then verse 9, this is described as a broadly positive outcome. So that's what happens. What does that mean, and why is it related to praise? Um, I think two things to try to help. First is the context in which this psalm and then the second one is what we can understand about the psalm from our knowledge of the New Testament. So let's look at the context. Psalm 148, if you were here last week, then you will have explored Psalm 148 with us. The end of Psalm 148, you don't need to turn it up, but I will tell you, at verses 11 to 13 says this. Kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and women, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord. 
And it continues. So, Psalm 148, the one immediately before this one that we have in front of us now, is hoping that everyone in the world will praise the name of the Lord. So, it seems to me that a starting point is that what we're looking at here is, some, is, is, is answering that in some way or another. But it's kind of interesting because Psalm 148 is looking forward to something that is joyful and hopeful and positive with the whole world praising the name of the Lord. And then in 149, we see a more uncomfortable, maybe militaristic approach. So we say, hmm, do, do these things fit together? How? Well, this is where I think... Um, looking to our knowledge of the New Testament is really helpful in illuminating the picture that's given to us in Psalm 149. So there are a number of um, New Testament texts that I think can be really helpful here. I'd like to give you some suggestions. I should say that after I gave these suggestions this morning, uh, people came up with a number of other suggestions. So I would like to emphasize that this is a non-exhaustive list uh, and I would encourage you to do this at home, actually, because there's a lot of richness that can be got from kind of looking at particular images and, the, you know, we'll see the double-edged sword. Think, how does that get picked up in the New Testament and what does that make me realize about what was going on in the psalm? So please do try this at home. But anyway, here's, here's, a, here's a little example. Um, Ephesians 6.17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. John chapter 1, the word of God is Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Matthew 10, 34, Jesus came not to bring peace, but a sword. Revelation 12, 11, the triumph is by the blood of the Lamb. And Revelation 1, 16, on the very last day, the image of Jesus Christ is there with a sword, a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. So what on earth does that tell us? There's a lot of information there. How does this kind of slot in um, and explain Psalm 149? Well, the first thing I think that slots into place is what we can take from these kinds of, this kind of militaristic um, imagery. The sword. It's not a blade that we will hold in our hands, but it is the word. It's the message of God and the person of Christ. The victory is not a victory over others in some kind of, uh, in some kind of physical battle, but victory over death. And the conquest is not a territorial conquest, but a spiritual one, an internal one, as hearts and minds and thoughts are turned over from selfishness to redemption. But why? What, what, is, what is this image? Why does Jesus bring a sword? Uh, how does it connect with the theme of praise? Uh, and that, I think, is the second thing which we can kind of slot into place. True justice means division. Not hatred, and not disrespect, and not antagonism, but distinction and difference, and discernment. Lady Justice, who is in top of the um, Central London Criminal Court, the Old Bailey, not far from here, uh, holds a sword in her right hand to divide the right from the wrong. Christopher Hitchens, the great polemicist, who is not frequently quoted from this uh, lectern, <laughs> said this very interestingly in, his, um, in 2010, when he was being interviewed by Jeremy Paxman and you can watch this on YouTube, the whole thing, if you're interested. He said this, If you say I'm a unifier, not a divider, you expect and usually get applause. I'm a divider. I think only division can cause progress. People talk about the politics of division. Politics is division by definition. If there was no disagreement, if there was no fight, there'd be no politics. The illusion of unity isn't worth having, and anyway, it's unattainable. So the point he makes, I think, is that if you stand for something, you normally stand against something else. And there's, I think he's capturing some element of what Jesus says when he says that he brings not peace, but a sword. Now, of course, and critically, 
Jesus does say also that he brings peace. And if you want a reference for that, I'd invite you to look at John 14, 27, where Jesus actually talks about him himself giving peace. So it's, this isn't the whole picture. The sword is not the whole picture, and it's really important to bear that in mind. But there is an important sense in which Jesus divides because he is one of the persons of God and one of God's qualities is justice. So I promised that this would fit into the theme of praise. And it seems to me that we have seen um, from the beginning of the psalm that the praise of God springs from um, what God is and what he has done. But the second half of the psalm talks about what shows us that praise springs from what God will do in the future. He will achieve the perfect division, the perfect justice, by separating from himself the unjust and gathering to himself the just. And that's what he says will happen on the last day, when God will make a new heaven and a new earth, and he will wipe away every tear, and there will be no suffering, and there will be no death. And of course, if we are part of that, if we participate in that, if we can be numbered among the just, that will not be because of anything that we have done, but it will be because God sent his own son to be crucified in our place and to impart to us the holiness that was properly due to him as a free gift of grace. And how could we not respond to that with praise? to the promise that despite everything that we have done and not because of anything that we have done, God has nonetheless decided to bring us in to be numbered among the just. And I think that one of the most striking things about that, or at least one of the striking things that emerges from this psalm, is that he does that to each Christian and doing and in doing so binds us not only to him but also to each other. And so why is this part of corporate praise? It's because one of the most fundamental things that we all have in common is that we are all the recipients of this grace. And so no matter what else might be the differences between us, we always have that in common. So when we meet together, when we offer praise together, we're saying something incredibly powerful about what it means to be us, to be in this church, to be brothers and sisters. So when we do speak to each other, when when you try out what I've encouraged you to do after the service or in the week ahead, perhaps be mindful of that as well. Can you call to mind the fact that if you're speaking to a brother or a sister, that that no matter what is the difference between the two of you, that you always have the most fundamental and eternal thing in common, which is to be a recipient of grace. Let's delight in that and praise the Lord for it. That's all I have to say about the psalm, um, so let me close by leading us all in a prayer. Heavenly Father, we, um, we praise you, first of all, for who and what you are. We praise you that you are the maker We praise you for the wonderful world you have made and we praise you that you are the king, that you are in control and that you rule all lovingly and justly. We praise you, Father, for what you have done. We praise you for the work of Christ crucified above all, but we also praise you for the many small ways in which you delight to bless us. And we call to mind the ways that you have blessed us in our lives maybe today, this week. And finally, Father, we praise you for what you have promised that you will do. Praise you for, praise you that you will bring the universe to an end in love and in justice and in perfection. And we look forward to that day in hope. In the precious name of Christ, amen.